appreciate people that are sensitive musicians, man. Whew. I was a worship leader growing up. Anyway, I won't tell stories, but it's exciting. Um, will you turn in your Bible, please, over to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. One thing that this house, our number one goal as a church is to host the presence of God continually in our personal lives, in our church, that this place would be a place that rolls out the red carpet. If the king came in here right now, I, I, I would venture to say all of us would hit our knees and be on our faces. And any crowns that we have would be cast <laughs> very quickly because of his presence. Because in his presence is everything that we have need of. Everything in life is found in him. And when we're in him, then suddenly our needs are met. When we're in him, suddenly things begin to come together. He teaches us how to stay married instead of cheat on our spouse. He teaches us how to raise our kids so that they honor him. And so they live a long life. I mean, he's... He's the answer to everything. And so when we were at the Jones Center, Center, and we were meeting in the chapel there as a church, and I told you guys the story about how God began to deal with me, that the cloud was moving. And I'm, I'm going to be a child of God that goes with the cloud. I said, well, God, show me where the cloud is going because I'm not staying here, you know. We're not staying here. We're going with the cloud. And the only word that God gave me was three words out of Luke 11. He said, ask, seek, knock. And when he, when he shared those words with me, and I read that scripture, and I read it many times over and over, and of course my mind went to uh, suddenly I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a marketing guy, and I'm a sales guy, and I'm beating on doors, and I'm knocking, and I'm asking, and I'm seeking and I, and I think a part of that would be true in the natural, but that's just where my natural mind went, was to there. I didn't anticipate where God was going to take me in that. Because in Luke chapter 11 is where Jesus talks to the disciples and he begins to teach them how to pray. He says, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I thought you were going to say it with me, but that's okay. I'll do a solo. I'll do a solo here. For yours is the kingdom, the glory, and the aunt power. Uh, see, you should have been with me. I'm teasing. Forever, forever and ever, amen. But that chapter leads into this verse that we're about to read. In fact, let's read it. In Luke 11, verse 9, it says this, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. And the interesting thing about these three things, this ask, seek, and this knock, is that each area has a unique purpose in entering into the presence of God. That was what I didn't anticipate. So because we've been talking about prayer, and you'll remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how prayer is fellowship with God. That's how, that's how we know the Father. I talked to you about how my wife and I fell in love through the mail. No, the actual mail that you put a stamp on the letters and you write them and you, because it was 91, that was social media then. And we fell in love, I fell in love with her because I wrote her letters, and she wrote me back, surprisingly, and I learned a lot about her through the mail. I really felt like I got to know her, but I only thought I knew her until we got face to face, and our relationship became much more intimate, and suddenly I know Nicole at a much greater level than I knew her before. And the interesting thing is now, here 31 years later, she's not the same woman I married. I'm still learning her. I'm, I think I'm at an ever, uh, ever, however you say that, I'm always learning. I'm always pursuing learning about her. Well, that's, that's, that's what our relationship with God is, and what we do in prayer 
is that fellowship and that intimacy that helps us know him more. Okay, so I want to read another scripture. I want to read a scripture over in Isaiah 40. So if you would turn over there and then we're going to come back to Matthew chapter 11. In Isaiah verse chapter 40, this is God. God is introducing himself to us. And he, so he's introducing himself. He's, he's showing you what he can do. But then he's also inviting us into a relationship through prayer. Listen to what it says in verse 28. We're going to read 28 through 31. It says, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. So even those that are the strongest, the youngest, they're going to faint and they're going to fall. But listen to verse 31. It says, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How many of you remember that song? There used to be a song. Those that wait on the Lord. Now, I've heard different definitions of that word wait. I, I remember I heard a minister one time talk about, you know, it's like a waiter with the towel and he's waiting on God, you know, or someone with the apron who's serving God. Well, I looked it up in the Hebrew and you know what it says? What it means? Wait. <laughs> Our favorite thing. <laughs> is to wait. I love waiting. Ah. But here's what I've discovered. You miss things if you don't stay long enough. You miss things if you don't stay long enough. You guys remember when the New York Giants played the, uh, the Patriots, New England Patriots, in the Super Bowl? That was years ago. And Eli Manning was quarterback, of the pa- you know, and of course, Tom Brady was quarterback of the Patriots. And I remember watching, watching, watching the opening drive. The Patriots got the ball. They took it all the way down in a matter of seconds. And they were kicking a field goal already. And I just did not have staying power. I did not want to watch a slaughter because I wanted Tom Brady to lose. I, d- I wasn't a New York fan. I don't know why. I just didn't want the Patriots to win again. And so anyway, so I got up and I left. I thought, I'm not going to stay and watch this slaughter that's about to happen. And so here's what happened. I missed the biggest upset in Super Bowl history. Because Eli Manning and the New York Giants beat the Patriots. Okay, well, maybe you'll get excited about something else. (laughs) Waiting is contrary to the microphone the microwave uh, culture we live in. It's contrary to it, right? Because everything with us is so fast-paced. Um, when we were traveling in ministry, we, we traveled for five years all across the country, and we spent a lot of time in the Dominican Republic, probably about six months in the Dominican Republic altogether. And so Nicole got really good at Caribbean Spanish. She's, she, w- she would have been fluent if we had stayed another two, three months. I guarantee it. Me, not so much. I'm a gringo. Just can't roll the R's, you know, kind of thing. And anyway, so while we're in the Dominican, though, we, we, were, we traveled around. We were in a lot of different cities, so we actually really got to know the, the culture. We weren't in Punta Cana where all the, you know, the tourists come. We were in, you know, inland. And so we got to know the culture. And the interesting thing about the Dominicans is they are so laid back. Now, some people will attribute that to island, you know, island mentality, whatever. They have a word for it. It's tranquilo. Am I right? Yeah. Tranquilo. Yeah, which basically for us, that word would mean relax. Just relax. Chill out. You know, and so, so they're always laid back. And so, but the interesting thing is you'll see their neighbors sitting on the front porch playing dominoes with each other. And there were occasions where I got to ride on the back of the scooter and they would take me across town to go run an errand or do something. And as we're driving across town, 
the driver is having conversations with all these different people on the drive. Because I kept asking him, I said, what were you saying to that guy? And he said, oh, he's telling me about my, his sister-in-law and how she's doing because she was pregnant. And then he talks to the next guy, well, well what was he saying? Well, he was talking about his job. He just got this new job. And, and I was like, I was amazed they're having a continual conversation as we're driving on the scooter down the road. You know, and so it reminded me of, well, how the United States used to be when we were slower and we would take time to have conversations with people, sit on the front porch, have a, have a conversation, you know, get to know one another. Well, anyway, there was a guy named Greg that I worked with in the Dominican. We had to convert the soundtrack to our production that we were taking over there to Caribbean Spanish, and so he was the editor. And so I worked with him through a translator and got to know Greg pretty well, found out he was coming to the States the next month. And he was coming to Tulsa, and I was going to be in Tulsa at the same time, and I said, dude, I was born and raised in Tulsa. I want to, I want to take you around and show you the highlights of my city. And he likes, you know, they eat a lot of chicken and rice. And I said, oh, I'm going to feed you some chicken. I'm going to go shopping, you know. And so we, we hung together that day. And I took him to Chick-fil-A, of course, you know. And so I want to feed him some chicken. And so he's eating this chicken. But I'm watching Greg because he's looking around at everybody. And he's watching the cars going through the drive through And he's watching people on their phones, not really talking to one another. And he's watching people come and leave. And, and he finally said, he said, you know, he said, I'm noticing that in this country, everyone is in a hurry to get where they're going. And everyone's got something to do. He said, you guys are so busy. Now, he, he didn't say any more, but for me, he didn't have to. I said, we're too busy. Because what that's done is that, think about the enemy strategy here, where I'm going to make Americans so busy that they'll have difficulty waiting on the Lord. Because what's the biggest problem for most people in prayer? It's only been five minutes. Dear God, I thought I prayed an hour already. People do it. It's real. Waiting on the Lord. And so what happens is we fall into prayerlessness. You know what prayerlessness is? It's ghosting God. Prayerlessness came, Adam was, remember when he sinned, he became prayerless. See, because prayer is hiding in God. Adam hid from God. And so what sin does is the fall of man brought about prayerlessness. So for us, the way that we keep our battery charged, how many of you charged your phone last night? Okay, a few of you. All right. So why did you charge your phone? So it will work today. How do you charge your spiritual battery? In prayer. But it's a, what, what's key to it is consistency. It's day in, day out, over and over. It's filling up your tank. And like I said, I said a moment ago, sometimes I feel like the great reminder. So not everything that I say is going to be this mic drop moment, but if you listen, it will be for you. Depends on what your expect expectancy is. Amen? So, prayerlessness, man, ha, that will drain your battery. And we want to stay full. It's, it's almost like a sail ship. The sail stays full. And when it stays full, guess what it does? It pulls you in the direction that you want to go in. Amen? All right. So, I want to talk about these three dimensions. Let's read that verse again in Matthew 7. Turn back over there. Yeah, turn back over to Luke 11. It's also in Matthew 7, but we'll go to Luke. <laughs> Matthew 7, 7. It's, it's in there too. Surprise, shocker. Spoiler alert. There's four Gospels. All right. Luke 11. Look at verse 9 again. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Okay, so... So what God is showing us here is that there's three dimensions of prayer. 
You could call it realms, you could call it places, but there's three places of prayer. There's ask, there's seek, and there's knock, right? So in the Old Testament, when God gave Moses the plan for the tabernacle, there were three sections to the tabernacle, right? There's the outer court, then there's the holy place, and then there's the holy of holies, right? Okay, so in regard to that, let's Let's break this down a little bit, and I'm going to ask my good friend Dave uh, Reinebo to come help me this morning. Yeah. Wow, Dave. It's, it's, it's the beard, man. It's the beard. So this is my good friend Dave, and uh, he's brought a contraption with him this morning. How many of you know what this is? Okay, how many other than Steve know what this is? Oh, Ellen knows. She's married to Dave. That's why she knows. So how many of you like to solve puzzles? Is there anyone in here that likes to solve puzzles? Right? Ellie, you were the first one to raise your hand. Would you mind coming and helping me? Yeah, give Ella a hand. Come on up here, Ella. So we're going to get you up here so that people can actually see you. Come on up here. So, so do you know what this is? Have you ever seen one of these before? You have. Do you know how it works? Um, yeah, a little. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, you go sit down because I need somebody that doesn't know. <laughs> Give Ella a hand. Thank you. Sorry. Anybody else like to solve puzzles? You've never seen this before. You want to try? All right. What's your name? Brian? Brian? Wyatt. Wyatt. Oh, guns, guns in the holster, man. It's all right. It's cool. <laughs> Wyatt Earp. Okay. Have you ever seen one of these? Uh, I know I've seen do it. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so here, do you know what you got to do? Let me tell you what you got to do first, okay? Um, John, you want to set a two-minute timer. We're going to give him two minutes here. This, you have to get completely uh, off. Out. Yeah. All right. So, you think you can do it? Yeah. All right. You ready, John? Yeah. Ready, set, go. By the way, this is Dave's, so he's available if you need, if you need him. You got this. And anybody else can help you too. Yes. You want a light for me? Ask Dave. Ask Dave. Wyatt, come on, man. <laughs> it's, it's easier to find the pit, hidden pictures, and it's not even easier to do that. Wow, give Wyatt a hand. He did such a great job. Congratulations, Wyatt. You know what was interesting to me? Is that Wyatt looked around, and he looked at his family. I'm assuming it's your family, right? Yeah, and... And he looked over here, and then he goes, and then he saw Dave, and he goes, 
Dave, it, it's your game. So I give Dave a hand. What was the purpose of that? <clears throat> Is that he turned to the owner of the game. Man, how many times do we get in a puzzle and we try to figure it out by ourselves? And we're just trying to solve it. And we're just trying to look at it from all the different angles. And we're trying to back up. And we're trying to, gee, how's this going to work? And, you know, my savings, I don't, I don't see how we can do it. We don't have enough in savings. And, and man, finances will really mess you up. And the interesting thing about God is that God can solve it like that. And he doesn't even need you. Doesn't even need your idea. Doesn't need you to try and figure it out. But when we put our hope and our trust in him, guess what he does? He resolves the issue. He tells us what to do. You guys remember the housing uh, craziness that was going on during COVID? Remember all the interest rates went bottomed out, and so everybody was buying homes. Even if they didn't need a home, they were buying a home, you know, and because the interest rates were so good, and everybody's trying to buy it. Well, during that time, Nicole and I had sold our home that we owned in Louisville, Kentucky. We'd had it for, I don't know how many years, 10 years, and it had been rented for seven of those years. And so we were just excited that it sold. Glory, man, out from underneath that, you know. And so, so we had our equity. And, we're, and now we're faced with a dilemma because the housing market's going crazy. And we're looking at everything. And I'm looking in the, you know, in a certain price range, which is a little lower. But the problem is, is because there's so many people going after the homes, the price was going up so high that it wasn't worth it to buy the house because it's never, it's probably not going to be at that value for another couple decades, maybe. And I thought, Lord, what are we going to do? And he showed us how, <laughs> he showed us what to do in the midst of that. And, and I remember that uh, there was a house that came up on the MLS. In fact, the, my realtor, when I told him what we were looking for, he goes, <laughs> he shook his head no at me. And I said, I said, just send me anything that you get in that neighborhood, you know, it, that has these features. And he sent it to me, and there were two houses. And thank God for a wife that has discernment, because I couldn't go. She went and looked at the first house and pulled in the driveway and said no. The realtor told me later, he goes, man, I love your wife because she knows how to make decisions, <laughs> you know. He said, instead of dragging me through the house for 45 minutes and then saying, nah, you know. And so she pulled in the driveway, and then she, there was the second one. Well, she pulled into the driveway of the home we live in now, and she said, write it up. And he goes, ma'am, you really need to look at it. And she said, no, write it up. And he goes, no, let's at least go inside. So he talked her into going inside. They looked her, and she kept saying over and over, write it up, write it up. Well, the next thing I knew, I was on the phone with him, writing it up. And I hadn't even seen it. I just saw some pictures online. And God, we, we put the offer in. There was an offer right behind us. And they accepted our offer. I found out at 7.30 in the morning, but I didn't know the rest of the story until a friend of mine talked to my realtor, unbeknownst to me, in another meeting. And he says, he told them there were 17 people in line for that house that were waiting for it to pop up on the MLS. And they called him mad because they said it never came on the MLS. But it did. I saw it. But see, God was hiding it from them, hiding it for us. God will hide stuff from others, hide it for you. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. And it was on my birthday. I bought the house. Nicole bought me a home for my birthday. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I'm sorry. I could, I could tell a joke there, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. So we're in the outer court. So this ask, you're in the outer court. Let's look at that because the outer court is where we make requests right? This is where we come to the altar of sacrifice, where we ask Jesus to come into our heart. We ask Jesus to forgive us. We make our requests known unto God. I'm believing you for this. Father, I'm asking you for this. I'm asking you for this, right? So we come in and we get to that point, but this is also the place where the enemy badger, where he comes in and tries to harass you. Why is that important? Because what he's wanting you to do is say amen and leave before you go any further into the tabernacle. This is why it's important. This is why I'm defining that word wait as, let me get back to it in my notes. 
I, don't, I think I skipped over this part. Stay long enough. Stay long enough. Amen? Okay. So the devil tries to do that, and he doesn't want you to progress into the holy place. But in order to progress into the holy place, it's going to cost you something. What's it going to cost you? Time. That's the price. Those that wait on the Lord. I, I hate waiting. Well, I'm sorry. It's the price. It's the price. And what a great thing to wait for. And so there's this progression. So what happens in the outer court? You have the altar of sacrifice. Nobody can come before the Father without the blood of Jesus being applied to their life. So oftentimes, so many times when I pray, sometimes I'll come and I'll say, Lord, if there's anything in my heart that's not right, if, there's, if I'm carrying offense and I don't know about it, if I've got anything going on, would you let me know? Because I want to get it under the blood of Jesus. I want, I want the blood of Jesus to remit it from my life so that I can progress further <clears throat> in my relationship with him. Then what do you come into next? The laver. You've got the altar of sacrifice. Now the labor, the labor where the priests wash their hands. Now we need the washing of the water of the word. Why? Because it renews our mind. Now we know better how to pray. And so instead of praying, God, please do this, please do this, bless me, increase me, God, cause this to happen. Now we're praying, Lord, your word says. Now we're bringing his word to him and putting him in remembrance of what it says. Lord, you promised in your word when my mom had her, experienced her massive heart attack, I didn't say, oh, Jesus, God, please save her, help her. No, man, Joel 3.10 says, let the weak say I'm strong, and I declare that my mom is strong in Jesus' name. And many of you don't know her story because she literally, uh, even though she was with us, Mentally, she had checked out, and we're in the car going to the hospital. I'm behind her. My dad's driving, and I've got her shoulders just keeping her awake. And I said, Mom, I want you to repeat after me. Little did I know she's experienced a massive heart attack where uh, congestive heart failure with her, where your lungs fill with fluid. You know, see, basically, you're drowning. And I didn't know what was going on because she's uh, trying to breathe. And I said, Mom, repeat this after me. Joel 3.10 says, let the weak say I'm strong. She said, let the weak say I am strong. Man, by the time we got to the hospital, she was praying out loud in tongues in the Holy Spirit in her, her heavenly prayer language so loud I thought, you know, we might be able to turn this. No, we need to check, <laughs> make sure everything is good. And sure enough, God, God did an amazing work. So the labor where our mind is renewed. So now we're praying according to to the Word of God. So what's the next step? Now, interesting, we've talked about these sections where the outer tent is the way, the next partition going into the holy place is the truth, and the next one is the life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, right? So, so we come through that truth curtain. Now we're in the holy place. Now, instead of praying and asking God for miracles and answers, we are seeking him. We're seeking the person, Jesus. Ah, oh, this is a great place to be because here's what happens. Suddenly, your words get fewer. Remember in Ecclesiastes, it says in 5 verse 2, it says, for God is in heaven, you are on earth, so let your words be few. He who knows the most should talk the most, <laughs> right? And so suddenly, ev suddenly anything you do say, you mean. This is a place where tears begin to flow. This is a place where worship begins to flood out of you. In fact, especially those of us that are worshipers, we can get stuck here in this room because we're so caught up in worshiping him and seeking him. Because the cool thing about seeking Jesus and being in this holy place room is that suddenly your needs are blacked out. <laughs> suddenly you're not even thinking about those anymore because you're so grateful. God, I'm so thankful for you. I'm so grateful for what you're doing in my life, God. You're the reason that I married well. You're the reason that my kids turned out the way they did. I, you're... <laughs> Yeah, man, it just, oh, it just 
flows out of you. So what's in that realm? So you've got the lampstand on the left. You've got the table of showbread on the right. You have the altar of incense in front of you, right? The bread, the bread, the very bread of life that you can partake of. Your worship and your praise coming up before God. Do you know how sweet smelling the morning this morning was to him? I mean, could you imagine the sweet smelling it's worship pouring from a sincere heart. So this is that second realm. So then you're seeking, but there's more. I don't mean to sound like an infomercial, but there is more. So stay put. Stay long enough that you don't turn and say amen and leave. And God's like this. Come on. Because here's what happens. You see. God, you seek Jesus, you seek the person of Jesus, and suddenly you, you sense you're in the Holy of Holies. Now, silence prevails in your life. You know, the, the times when, remember when Moses, God showed himself to Moses, and then when God showed himself to Elijah? Were they talking? Mm. the awe of God. That's when your chin drops and you've got nothing to say because he's literally overwhelming. Morgan, when I was praying for you, man, you were shivering. Holy Spirit was filling. See, your body, our physical bodies can't handle the presence of God. Whew, it's good stuff. <clears throat> so, seeking Jesus. Psalm 4610 says this. Becca, could you help me? Thanks. It says, be still and know that I am God. You only know he is God when you take the time to get still. Or you have to still your heart, still yourself. It's where, do you know what this does? I love, Gary and I were talking about this. And Gary made this statement, and I, man, I remembered it, man. He said, this isolates you. It does. <clears throat> there was something, as we were leaving the Dominican Republic, there was something that was beginning to happen with the young people in the Dominican that, that was disheartening. You were seeing more and more kids walking around like this. flipping through the phone. It isolates you. Why? Because they're no longer looking up. They're no longer looking out, seeing people developing relationships, talking to people. So here's what happens. <clears throat> Many Christians don't make it into the Holy of Holies. Why? Because they say amen and leave too soon. They say amen and leave the outer court. They say amen and leave the holy place. And all the time, if they would have stayed long enough, they would have made it in. Uh, one man of God was saying that, he said, he said, I believe it takes an hour and a half. I'm not trying to put a time limit on it, but he was the one that, I, that said this and I, I was looking at him going, hey, you would know. Because you have been in the presence of God. I know you have. Hour and a half. Interesting, I think an hour is, is pivotal because Jesus said, could you not pray with me? Could you not watch with me for one hour? There's something about an hour where, it, where, it, where you finally get through that. And, and Dave, Ronabo and I were talking about this, where you get through that, that um, <clears throat> overcoming your physical man putting your physical man down where Paul, you know, talks about that I beat my body into subjection. Oftentimes, that's what you've got to do when you pray. Uh, for me, it's difficult when it, because I have to walk and pray because I, ever since I moved to Arkansas, don't know what it is about Arkansas, God wakes me up at three in the morning, every morning. Last night, it was one, and I was like, oh, God. I said, are you sure? And so, 
So when I pray, I have my closet, and I am, if you've seen our bathroom, it's like you could drive a forklift in there. I don't know. It's, it's too large. I don't know why, but it is. But I love it because I can pray in there. And I'll walk this way, and I'll begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. And I walk because if I don't, I'm going to fall asleep. But something happens from 1 o'clock until about 1.45. At 1.45, something happens. I go and I sit down because I just want to still myself. And suddenly he begins to speak. And I've got a little journal pen right there on my thing, whatever that's called. <clears throat> In her closet, I don't know what it is. But, and I write down what he says. But if I, I wonder if I hadn't have taken the time if I had gotten that far. See, because can we come into the presence of God in five minutes? Can we rush through? He said, come boldly into the throne room. One translation says, come boldly into the holy of holies. What that's talking about is that the blood of Jesus has given you the boldness to follow the roadmap. We're not supposed to blow by the altar of sacrifice and blow by the laver and blow by the table of showbread and burst the curtains open and say, here I am. Because before he, God was your homie, he's king. So there's, there's an honor and there's a roadmap. God has given us the roadmap. He said that the tabernacle here is the picture of the one in heaven. It's very similar, three, three sections, but there's things that we walk through. And so I'm just, I'm just trying to help you. I'm not trying to create theology and, and put stumbling blocks in front of you. But I'm, I am here to say that there's a price just like there's a price to sanctification. Because justification is that the penalty of sin has been paid on my behalf. But sanctification is the breaking of the power of sin over my life. It's a, it's a progression. And then one day my body is going to be saved. Thank God. Oh man, I'll stop getting older. All right, let me, let me land the plane. <clears throat> Here's what God wants. God wants our partnership. He wants us to make it into the Holy of Holies because of this partnership. Listen to what he said in Ezekiel 22, verse 30. Ezekiel 22, verse 30. He said, so I sought a man among them who would make a wall, who would stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. See, you become in this place an intercessor. There is great agreement in the Holy of Holies. And it's not us trying to get God to agree with what we want. It's us agreeing with what he wants. <clears throat> See, everything, you look at Moses' life, everything in Moses' life from 80 on was him agreeing with the Father. Nowhere in there did I see him working his own plan. I saw God telling him what to do every step of the way. Him being completely yielded to the plan of God. And it took him places that I know he couldn't have imagined in his heart. That's what we're endeavoring to do here in the church. That's my 100% desire is that I want to follow God's plan. This right here, what you're seeing, this is what obedience looks like. That's all this is. This is just Nicole and I saying, yes, Lord, you want us to have a church in Springdale, Arkansas? I don't understand it. I was having fun traveling, really enjoyed getting to see places and meet people and evangelize. But for some reason, you want us to pastor. Because let me tell you, pastoring's hard. It is not easy. Go, go try it. Okay, <clears throat> last, last, last thing here. Think about this. It took 120 people for God to impact the world. It took 120 people praying and coming into the Holy of Holies for that to happen. It took three men who prayed at the same realm that God ignited and started the Welsh revival out of that. Think about that, because it doesn't take a lot of people to change the world, but here's what it does take. It takes someone who's willing to stay long enough. Ah, when is that worship deal we're gonna be doing, Zach? <clears throat> huh? 
the after service worship okay well yeah we're getting, we're setting a date for it we were talking it through in staff meeting <clears throat> just having a conversation with the camera again um we're we we're setting a date because on a sunday coming up soon um at the dismissal of church we're going to stay and fast and worship until three like our the, remember our first service that we did here when we came here we we fasted that first lunch and we worshiped all until about three o'clock so it's going to be a similar opportunity <clears throat> so i'm you may want to write that down once we give you that date okay so wow jesus how do i land the plane there's just so much <clears throat> Let me read Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. God said, I sought a man, so he's looking for someone who will pay the price to take the time to wait on him. So think about what God can do through you. Listen to what it says in Ezekiel 36, verse 37. Thus says the Lord, I will will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their men like a flock. See, God is looking for someone who will pay the price, who will stay long enough. But here's my question. How much is his presence worth to you? What would you be willing to pay? Because Jesus has finished the work. He's not going to do anything else except come back. I mean, he's done everything. It, it's, it's a full, complete work. And so you and I now, have, we have this great blessing of the gift of salvation, the gift of healing, the gift of the promises of God. But I don't know about you, but when I look in the Bible and I see the children of Israel and he says, I've given you this promised land, a man flowing, a land flowing with milk and honey, I've given it to you. And they come across the sea, right, on dry ground, and they're there, and and they consecrate themselves. And he says, I have given it to you. And you look, and there's fortified city. You gave it to us. (laughs) I think sometimes we're just waiting for God to just hand it down on a silver platter to us, not understanding that we have to go and get it. We have to go and pay the price sanctification there's a price for it and you're not going to get there just by hoping one day well one day God will take this desire from me no the desire gets less and less for this because the desire for him gets more and more and so sin begins the voice of sin gets softer and softer and softer and and the still small voice of God gets louder and louder in your life and still yet remains a still small voice. But you have clarity to hear it because the noise is gone. Ah, Okay. Glory. Well, did you get something out of that? Glory to God. Would you bow your heads all around the room?